I'm Jennifer Frazier. I'm one of the biologists here at the Exploratorium. And today I'm going to be talking about the human microbiome and sharing some of the research we've been doing for our exhibition called Cells to Self. So chances are you've already heard something about the microbiome. It's something that's really captivated the imagination of both scientists and the general public. So this sort of overview of magazine covers, you know, from scientific publications like Science and Nature show that it's something scientists have been really excited about, but it's also really interested the public because it seems like it might have some practical outcomes, like how could we lose weight with fast metabolism microbes? Should we let dogs lick our babies? It also gets at what does it really mean to be human? Now, answering what is it to be human could take much longer than this talk. So a little snapshot on how would we sort of define being biologically human? I look to the NASA Voyager project. So this was, in 1977, NASA sent up this golden record, which was to communicate with extraterrestrials all sorts of things about us here on Earth, including some snapshot images of what I considered uh, biological humans. So what are humans? Oh, we're things that carry ink blots inside of our stomachs. We have DNA, and I'm not sure how an uh, extraterrestrial would have interpreted that. We have cells that divide. We have some sort of like cross section showing where we, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how someone would interpret that, but we have thin sections uh, and organs. And also most intriguingly, we drink wine out of carafes. We eat off both sides of a grilled cheese and we provocatively lick ice cream. <laughs> but if we were to talk about what it is to be human today, there's something that would have made it onto the new golden record and that's microbes. So we, before we go too far, I s we have to do a few definitions. Uh, microbe is a creature that's too small to be seen with the naked eye. So it's not really a scientific term, it's more of an operational term. And that would include bacteria, archaea, fungi, viruses, basically anything incredibly small. And the microbiome is the totality of microorganisms in a sample. So that might be like a water sample, a soil sample, or you as a sample. So the thing that's really been captivating to people is that while we have 39 trillion human cells, it's now known that we have 30 trillion microbial cells. So there's almost a ratio of one to one mi of a micro, for every human cell, you have almost one microbial cell. But what's important is to put this into perspective with scale. So this is, I sort of like these old school drawings. And you know, if this is a grain of sand, it actually seems like an asteroid coming out at you, like, oh, that's a grain of sand. Uh, if this is a grain of sand, and this is one of the smallest human cells, this is a red blood cell, bacteria are far smaller than even the smallest human cell. So they're very, very, very tiny. And just to put this into perspective, I was trying to figure out how to scale it. And I looked up that the average human is 170 pounds. And when you search on Google for 170 pound celebrity, because I wanted something you guys would recognize, and I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings by calling out that they weighed 170 pounds, you get Kevin Bacon. So Kevin Bacon weighs 170 pounds, roughly, or at least he did at the time of the, you know, this film. And if he weighs 170 pounds, all the microbes in his body are two and a half packages of bacon. So even though it's roughly one to one as far as cells, because they're so small, it's not that much of much volume. So the total like weight of your microbiome is about two and a half packages of bacon. Now, we, it's, they're not just kind of sitting there like a two and a half packages of bacon somewhere in an organ inside your body. We have microbes all over us. We have them you know, in our respiratory tract, all over our hands and skin. I mean, there are even studies showing your right hand and left hand are different. We have them in our private areas. And an uh, area I'll talk about a lot today is we have microbes throughout our gut. So basically any part of you that's exposed to the outside has microbes in it and they're distinct. Now, sort of if you think of them, it's again, not just something that's just sitting there that's unchanging. Our microbiome changes over the course of our lifetime. So you don't need to worry about what these little colored blobs mean. They're sort of representations of how your profile of your microbiome is changing over time. And you can see that you know, it's very different for different kinds of infants. It's different when you're a child, when you're an adult, and then when you're elderly. And some of that may look a lot like our Frank Oppenheimer sculptures that we have around the museum. So it changes over your lifetime. 
And there's actually a, also a study uh, uh, on the necrobiome because we also go through characteristic changes in our microbiome after we die. So that's also an active area of research, but too depressing for today's talk. The other key thing is that our microbiome changes every day. So here we have subject A, subject A's gut. So this is a snapshot of their gut microbiome and subject B's gut. And again, don't like try to overanalyze all the different colors. The main thing to focus on is, you know, here are the profile of their different microbes in subject A and subject B over the course of 365 days. So this is a year. And you can see that kind of the levels are changing. And they also were subject to perturbation. So here, subject A, this is when subject A was living abroad. You can see a big shift in kind of their bacterial profile. And here is when subject B had a terrible bout of diarrheal illness. So you can see that these things sort of shift uh, over the co course of the year. So this is where I was trying to line up a live saxophone because I wanted a little, for the microbial interlude, I thought it would be really nice to have like careless whisper or smooth operator to kind of like micro microbiology interlude, a little sax interlude, but you're just, I won't even try to do it with my voice. So we'll just, just pretend you're hearing a saxophone. Uh, I think to start to understand, oh wow, it's in all these different places. It's changing over time. A little bit of a, bi a microbiology primer is helpful because it's not just going to help you understand what I'm going to talk about today, but every time you're reading something about the microbiome in the future, you'll be able to apply your, your few slides of microbiological background. So if you look at this, this is an artist's rendering of a very small uh, microbe called Mycoplasma genitalium, and all of these different colored blobs, you know, they're, they're basically proteins that do chemical reactions. So if you're looking up close at a bacteria, you notice, wow, it doesn't have eyes, it doesn't have a nose, it doesn't have legs. Yeah, these things, they're not building nests and hunting rabbits. They're not eating grass. The way that I think of microbes is they're little, literally little chemical factories. They're not doing anything that you're used to thinking of creatures doing. They're like taking in CO2, they're converting nitrate to nitrite. Like all they do is chemical reactions. I mean, larger organisms are also always doing chemical reactions, but they also do exciting things that we can watch with binoculars or observe in the wild. These really are just carrying out chemical reactions, and that's the primary, primary thing that they're doing. The other thing that it's kind of good to know about microbes is that they divide very quickly. So uh, this is E. coli, and if it's in a really rich environment, E. coli can divide every 20 minutes, and by the end of a day, there will be 5,000 billion billion E. coli. So they're really, really small. And you know, whereas a human, it's gonna take us you know, anywhere from 16 to 46 years to reproduce, or even higher, I guess. Like, when did Janet Jackson have her baby? 54? <laughs> well, humans might have a very long span in generations. With, bac with bacteria, it can be very quick. And this means that they basically can live in almost every environment, right? They're dividing quickly, they can evolve quickly, they're taking in different chemicals, they're putting out different chemicals, so they can live in virtually every environment on Earth. Almost everywhere we've looked, we find microbes. They're in the soil, they're in the clouds. I mean, there was even a recent article about viruses that, come d that are living in clouds and like falling on us every day. I hope that doesn't freak you out, it's, it's really interesting. They're in hot springs, they're in jungles, they're out in the middle of the, the sort of like what would seem empty ocean, they're microbes. And it's not just sort of these like, beautiful screensaver environments that they're living in. They're also living in all the other environments you can think of, like armpits, every surface of Disneyland, from the roller coaster seats to the caramel corn, and your office. You can actually tell if someone shares an office with another person because their microbes have become so similar. And of course, your poop. So, you know, I think a different way of thinking is, you know, we basically, we are a whole series of environments. Our face is an environment, our nose is an environment, our armpits, our private areas. To a microbe, it's the same as like a desert, a jungle, a hot spring. They're all just different chemical environments, certain moisture levels, certain pH. They're, they're not really analyzing whether like it's an armpit or a savanna. So I think the main thing that I wanted to focus on today, that which I think has probably been the focus for most people, is the gut microbiome. And the reason to sort of zoom in, you know, even though private areas, noses, and skin are really interesting, the gut microbiome has been really the focus of the most study because it's actually 95% of our microbiome. So the majority of microbes on, our, on and in our bodies are in our gut. They co-evolved with us, 
and they're really critical for our survival. They extract nutrients, produce vitamins, fight pathogens, and they shape our immunity. So this has been a huge area of research. I mean, it's really just starting, and over the last decade, there's a lot more understanding of how these microbes are really critical for our survival. So sort of, again, like some sort of primers on the gut itself. We talked earlier about how each person has a unique gut, you know, subject A and then poor subject B who had the illness. In different cultures, you see, like, they have a distinct microbiome. So this was looking at Asian school children. And, you know, again, don't worry about what species it is. But, you know, even in regions that may have somewhat similar diets, you can see that, oh, wow, children in Bangkok have a lot fewer of the yellow bacteria than people in Tokyo. More strikingly, studies that have looked at, this is in Burkina Faso, where they eat a more traditional diet, so they haven't moved over to a more processed diet you see very different microbes than you do in European children. I'm not sure why all these studies were done in children. Maybe it's because they don't drink. Who knows? But uh, different cultures have very different microbiomes. And, you know, again, to go through how all these changes that happen in our microbiomes over our lives, it really reflects, you know, how why are these microbiomes so different, depending on, like, where you're living or, you know, other conditions. And it's because diet, antibiotics, other environmental factors and genetics are what really shape the gut microbiome. And so if you think over a lifetime, I mean, one thing that's going to come up later when we talk about some of the research studies, so this little ink blot, and every time I look at this, I'm like, that's, that's a fetus, which could also be like a Rorschach test. If you go to our memory exhibition, it's like, I don't know who drew that. But um, when, you, when you're not born, you actually do not have a microbiome. You've not been exposed to the vi environment yet. So a fetus... Does, it does not have a microbiome, and that's going to come up a little bit later when we talk about some of the studies in mice. But then there are critical things that happen at every stage of your development that influence what happens to your microbiome. So, uh, you know, one huge area of study is, like, babies that are born by C-section versus vaginal delivery have very different microbiomes, so it's thought that basically vagina microbes are your initial inoculation, like, critical for the development of your microbiome. Whether you're breastfed versus formula fed has a huge, huge influence on your gut microbiome. And uh, actually, uh, Mary and Melissa had invited someone from UC Davis. They actually think that 20% of breast milk is not for the infant, but actually selects for beneficial microbes. It's actually like a little cocktail that's helping you get the right kind of microbiome in your system. Um, uh, something that's really critical for younger children, I mean, there have been a lot of studies showing that antibiotics have a huge impact on your microbiome development. And the average U.S. child has 10 courses of antibiotics before the age of 10. So the research showing how critical this is is helping uh, try to emphasize, you know, that you shouldn't resort to antibiotics unless it's the last resort. And also there have been a lot of studies that children who grow up in rural areas or have dogs in particular have more robust, diverse microbiomes. And they think that's because they're getting exposed to more microbes from their environment. And then, you know, when you're older, I didn't include death because I didn't want to, like, bum you out at this time of day. But uh, basically, later on in life, you know, your diet has a huge impact. And because we're talking about interactions with your cells, of course, there's a, gen a genetic component. So these things really shape over the course of a lifetime, like what kind of gut microbes you have. Now, this is just, again, to kind of get back to that environment when we're thinking a little bit more of the medicine. So I didn't include, like, an actual cross-section of the gut. This is... I'm a cell biologist, so I prefer nice, clean schematics because I don't want to look at, like, a bloody mess. So here's your stomach up here. And then as you go through these different environments, this is food, like a nice representation of, like, the different bacteria, sugars. It's very different at the top of your GI tract than it is at the bottom. And again, if we're thinking of ourselves as environments, you know, and sort of a selection over time, you know, the top, there's higher pH. Down here, there's lower pH. Up here, there are all these kind of like long chain sugars that can't get broken down. They've already been broken down down here. So this is why diet plays a role, is that the diet that you're eating, whatever it is you're consuming, creates the environment in your gut. So again, if you're kind of thinking hot springs, desert, you're creating an environment based on the food that you're eating. And I will say this has definitely cut down on my drinking and my consumption of refined sugars. <laughs> so you're creating a, an environment in your gut. So I think what I'm going to try to do is go through some of the studies, and we'll, we'll get into this in a second, because, the, you know, there's the basics about the gut microbiome, but 
because it's so tightly linked to our diet and, and there's a lot of health implications, I've taken some of the studies that have gotten, I think, the most headlines and seem to be of the most interest to people, and I've sort of extracted a few bits that you can take away so that you'll be up to speed on what's known most about the gut microbiome. Um, and the first thing that I think got the most attention was the link between the gut microbiome and weight. So this slide is just showing, you know, this is sort of like percent of bacteria and this is time. And what it was really showing is that the ratio of the types of bacteria between lean people, so here, over here we have someone who's considered lean, and this was really looking at obese people, so people who were like clinically defined as obese. So here they are in week zero, and they found that their f the type of bacteria called firmicutes, there the ratio of the firmicutes to the bacterioids was much, much higher. So obese people had very, very few bacterioids compared to lean people. So you can see the lean people have a much higher number of bacterioids. So then, I don't know how they got people to do this. They got them to go on a diet for 52 weeks. So there must have been some pretty strong <laughs> incentives. And they found that over time on the diet, they could increase their number of bacterioids. So this was just showing that diet could change your ratios and that there seemed to be this correlation between what microbes you had and your weight. But this same lab, what was even more astounding is that then they later did these sort of transplant studies where they took twins. So there was an obese twin and a lean twin. And I don't, I'm trying to imagine the ads in the newspaper around the campus like, looking for twins, one obese and one lean. It must have taken quite a while to uh, get that study group together. But what they did is they, they picked twins so that the genetics were the same, right? There wouldn't be any genetic differences between the different donors. And they basically took the microbes from the obese twin and transplanted it into a mouse. And they took the microbes from the lean twin and transplanted it into a mouse. And this is where I just want to pause because these mice are going to come up over and over again. These are called notobiotic mice. So that means like known biome. And this is their little cage. I didn't show one up close because it seemed kind of sad. But um, notobiotic mice are sort of the workhorse of the microbiome field. And what they are are germ-free mice. So if you remember a few slides ago, I told you that a fetus does not have any microbes. It has to be inoculated from birth and then gets them from their environment. These mice spend their entire lives until they, I guess, participate in a study with no exposure to microbes. So their food is sterilized, their air is sterilized, their water is sterilized, and they grow up in these little tiny bubbles so that they're sort of pure and you don't, th there's no microbes in their system. So that means when you put in these, the gut microbes from the obese twin, you know, you know that you're starting with a blank slate. So they put in the obese micro, you know, the microbiome from the obese person, the microbiome from the lean person, and then they fed, these mice were identical, right, genetically identical, and fed the exact same amount of food and they found that over time, those mice that got the microbes from the obese twin had a much, much higher uptake of fat. So they seemed to be more efficient at fat uptake. And the reason that this was so startling and interesting to people is it showed that microbes alone could confer like physical characteristics onto um, the host. So it's not just like your microbes are making vitamins for you and doing all these things to serve you and chomping up your lettuce for you they actually can have an impact on your weight. So that was a pretty like groundbreaking discovery. Now this slide, okay, I hope most of you have finished your lunch because what you're looking at are mouse cecum. So we'll get to this in a second because this is another study that's also been really interesting, which is linking the gut microbiome to immunity. And in, in particular, this was around peanut allergies. So mice, they have a mouse model. I don't think it's technically called a peanut allergy, but they're, they have peanut sensitivity. So they, they have a sensitivity. And the way that they assay for how, so a, a normal mouse, this is their cecum, which is basically you can think of as their gut. So in a normal mouse, you know, it would look something like this. This is a, this is a happy gut from a mouse. Now, what they found that was interesting, yeah, I know it's a, it's like what I'd like, I think my, Kids walked behind me, I was making this, like, disgusting, what is that? No, it's not, that's, oh, honey, that's a mouse colon. Yeah, that, anyway, so this is what a normal one looks, it's like not inflamed, looks kind of pink. I don't, we don't need to worry about what those brown things are. Uh, when you raise a germ-free mouse, right, so they have no microbes th in these peanut allergy mice, the bottom line is like, they don't look happy. 
they get kind of like inflamed. So this is the way that they were assaying for allergy. So when these, these peanut sensitive mice had no microbes, they basically just like sort of had unhappy intestines. When they added back bacterioids, it still didn't look like it really uh, like diminished the allergy. But if they put in a bacteria called Clostridia, it actually got it more toward sort of the happy looking intestine. So if, if all of that, you know, if you just can't stand looking at these things, I'll tell you the upshot, which is adding back one specific kind of bacteria decreased the peanut allergy in these mice. So it basically made them from looking like unhappy, sensitive, allergenic, inflamed, to looking much more healthy. And then when they looked at the blood serum, so this is just a graph of like peanut allergy or sort of allergen levels in the blood. If there were no bacteria, the levels of sort of these allergens were really high. If they added this bacterioids, it, it went down a little bit, but not a lot. But again, when they added Clostridia, it was very, very low. And basically the hypothesis is they did a lot of other blood work on these mice. And what they think is happening is that these bacteria are breaking down some of the antigens. So if you imagine, and, and the, this, they think that these bacteria are really important for food allergies. So basically when you're eating, you imagine the tens of thousands of things that you eat every day and all the allergens that might be present in your stomach. Uh, many researchers think that one of the roles of your gut microbiome is to be breaking up these allergens or sort of finding ways to present them differently to your immune system. And there is a lot of thinking that maybe what's happened over the last 50 years, there's this huge spike in people with food sensitivities and different food allergies. And one hypothesis is that it's antibiotics and lack, of basically that we're losing our microbial diversity. And so there are fewer microbes to like deal with these antigens. And so that's been a really interesting area of research, linking the gut microbiome with allergies. Now this is something you just, you have to know about if you don't already. And I hope, now I truly hope you finished with lunch because this is about probably one of the most successful medical studies that involves the microbiome. And these are fecal transplants. So this is an extreme case. This isn't just for the everyday person, but there's a really serious GI condition called Clostridium difficile. It's an infection where basically these really harmful microbes take over your gut microbiome. So you have nowhere near like what would be considered a normal microbiome. You have a very harmful bacteria and it, it's devastating to people. I mean, they're very, very sick and hospitalized with this condition. And basically they found that even antibiotics w had very little effect on curing people of Clostridium difficile. And to be honest, I'm not sure who came up with this idea, but something that has been extremely effective. So this is a fecal transplant down here. So they literally take feces from a donor. I think they do some things to it. And then they put it down the nose and into your GI tract. And they were doing clinical trials of this and they actually stopped the clinical trial because it was 94% effective. So it was so effective at curing Clostridium difficile that they stopped the trial because it wasn't fair to the placebo group, right? If you know something is so effective, you, it's not fair to the placebo to like have the trial continue. So this is something that I'll kind of get to back in the end where they don't understand why this works. You know, it's still not clear what, what are the specific bacteria, what's the mechanism, but they know that it works and so they're going forward with it. And just as an aside, when I was doing research for this talk, I came across many non-peer-reviewed studies and websites recommending that you do your own fecal transplants, including people who go to like more traditional cultures where they think that everything is pure and amazing and then they give themselves fecal transplants out in the field. I am just here to tell you that the Exploratorium does not advocate <laughs> like do-it-yourself fecal transplants. This is something that is being studied in hospitals and should be done in a clinical setting. So that's just a little safety aside on fecal transplants, but it has been very, very effective and we'll kind of come back to like what this means for other conditions in the future. Now, what I'm really gonna get into now that I think has been like the most startling, all these other things, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Gut microbes and weight, right? I eat, I either am putting on weight or not, that kind of makes sense. Or things about, you know, you have a horrible infection and you need to have poop go through your nose. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Or maybe, you know, you're presenting at food allergies. I could even see how that relates to the gut. 
the thing that's been really mind-blowing in the last few years has been some initial inklings that your gut microbes have a huge impact on behavior, neurodegenerative diseases, mood. So this is what's being called the gut-brain access, that the microbes in your gut are having an influence on things in your brain. So again, I'm just gonna kinda go over some highlights from some of those sort of like key studies. Um, and one of the first was around gut microbes and behavior. And this was that mice who were fed lactobacillus rhamnosus, so not all lactobacillus is the same, I'm, that's a critical takeaway. <laughs> um, they're less anxious. So, you know, again, as a cell biologist who didn't work on mice, I'm like, what is an anxious mouse? Well, an anxious mouse, I basically, I guess they know which, which mice tend to be anxious or not. And then they make them do these things, like I, this is an basically an elevated maze where there's a closed part of the maze and there's an open part of the maze. So this is just one of the many examples of tests that they gave these mice. It's like, welcome to the world. We're gonna take you out of your little bubble and then put you on this elevated maze. So what they found is that the control mice, this is the amount of time they spend on the open arms. So these are the open arms of the maze where you can imagine a mice, a, an anxious mouse might not like to go. It's gonna be really like upsetting to be out on these open arms. So they found that the control mice spent far less time, this is the amount of time they're spending out on the open arms, it's lower than those mice who got lactobacillus. So mice that were given lactobacillus spent a lot more time hanging out on the open arms of the maze. And this was true with lots of other anxiety tests. The one that I didn't show you was that they'd throw mice in water and see how long they'll try to swim, and less anxious mice struggle longer. So I decided not to include that slide or video. Um, they found similar things with zebrafish. So we have zebrafish here at the Exploratorium. They're a model organism, fish that they use to study different conditions. And they found that fish that were given a different lactobacillus strain are also less anxious. Now, you might be wondering how you look at what is a fish? What's an anxious fish? Well, an anxious fish, I guess, swims on the bottom of the tank. So you take the, the fish, you throw it into a tank. I guess a, an anxious fish spends a lot of time at the bottom and one that is less anxious is more likely to go to the top. And that would, I guess, make sense because maybe there are predators up there. Um, and so they found that, again, a control fish spent less time at the top. They went less to the upper zone, whereas those that were given lactobacillus were more likely to go to the top. So, again, these were just sort of some initial studies that were showing the addition of a microbe could sort of change behavior in these model organisms. Um, Another area, so these are so there have been a lot of different studies on things like mood, depression, and again, they're just correlative. Like, oh, we've given this bacteria, we see this thing happen. Something that has become another really interesting area is that there are a lot of labs now studying the connection between the gut microbiome and sort of neurodegenerative diseases or neural conditions. Today, I'm gonna focus on Parkinson's disease, but there's also a lot of research on autism. Um, so again, that there might be this connection between the gut and autism. And one of the things that is true, this is also true of autism, but was noticed in Parkinson's disease is there were some researchers at Caltech, one studied autism and one was just working on the microbiome. It was like a micro, mi you know, microbiologist and a, and a neuroscientist. And I guess they were out for coffee one day and the neuroscientist basically was mentioning that people who have Parkinson's disease have like a lot of GI issues 10 years ahead of when they show any symptoms. So Parkinson's disease is really well known for more of the, it's basically you form these plaques in your brain from something called alpha-synuclein. And what happens is sort of over time, your neurons are degenerating and there are a lot of like neuromuscular disorders. Like you get tremors, balance problems, stiffness, change in voice, slow movement, trouble handwriting, and it affects about a million American I Americans a year. So it's not a rare disease but it had always been considered sort of this motor, neuron, motor function disease. But when these researchers were talking, it was like, well, wow, what if it's actually a disease of the gut? You know, that there's something happening in the gut that then is affecting the brain. So what this uh, microbiome researcher at Caltech did is he started, he basically tried to start studying this in mice. So basically what they found is that the gut microbiome exacerbated some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. And what does this mean? So this. These are slices of a mouse brain. So they made a mouse model of, of Parkinson's. Again, who knows if mice really get Parkinson's, but they made this model where they overexpressed the protein associated with Parkinson's. So it's called alpha-synuclein. 
they made mice that overexpressed it and started having Parkinson's like symptoms. And when they looked at their brains, the ones that are overexpressing the alpha synuclein had way more. These pink things are plaques in the brain of sort of these alpha synuclein plaques. And they found that in those mice that they germ free, again, those mice that are never exposed to microbes, they had far fewer plaques. So it's like, hmm, this is interesting. These mice, when they have microbes, they seem to have a lot more of these plaques in their brain. And those that don't have microbes seem to have a lot fewer plaques. And then, of course, they put them through another battery. These are the many, like, motor tests. You know, here's a mouse swimming, mice running on wheels. I honestly had no idea of the, the things that they would do to mice. Um, another thing that they did was a test of mice on this balance beam. So you can imagine this is a pretty good test for, like, how good a mouse's motor skills are. And again, this is just a slide showing that, you know, in a mouse that had microbes, the time to cross the beam, if you look at the sort of high graph, it took sort of the Parkinson's mouse that had this overexpressing protein, it took it a lot longer time to cross the beam than those that did not have microbes. Those that did not have microbes were a lot more like an unaffected mouse. So again, this was just sort of like some interesting initial research, but there's a lot of work being done on Parkinson's and a lot of other, neuro like there are these hints that things like autism and other things affecting the brain may have to do with the gut. Now, again, thinking only as a cell biologist, how could this be, right? How could it be that things in your gut are affecting things like mood or Parkinson's disease, potentially autism? Right now, these are all sort of like correlations. It's not like anyone's saying like, oh, definitively microbes affect your mood or they cause Parkinson's. It's not that. They're just these hints that they may be playing a role. And the way that many people are postulating they might be playing a role is, you know, if you, this is a super schematic, here are the cells of your gut and here are those microbes. So there are actually 70% of your peripheral neurons are in your gut. So we are always thinking about like our fingers, our toes, most nerves are actually going to your gut. So there's a very direct connection. There are neural endings in your gut lining, and especially the vagus nerve, which is a huge nerve that does connect your brain and gut. I had no idea about this before preparing for this talk, but 90% of your serotonin, so neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, they, they're a majority of them are in your gut. So 90% of your serotonin is actually in your gut, adjacent to all these neurons that are connected to your brain. And, you know, when we were talking about peanut allergies earlier, there's also a very direct connection between your microbiome and immune cells. There mo the majority of your immune cells are in your gut, which again makes sense because it's probably looking for pathogens or invaders in food. But, you know, what a lot of researchers are exploring is like, okay, yes, it doesn't seem as far-fetched as it might sound between the number of nerve endings and the number of, like, basically neurotransmitters and other molecules being made all the time every day by all these microbes in your gut and your immune cells, there it definitely seems like it's possible there could be a link between your brain and your gut, and that's a huge area of research. But that, you know, what can become overwhelming at some point is that basically anything, this was only pages, this was a recent review on how the gut microbiome is linked to diseases, and this is only A through the beginning of C. I mean, I think what's starting, what's happening right now is that they have these new approaches for studying the gut microbiome, which is basically sequencing your poop. So they have high throughput sequencing and really good genomic analysis. And right now these are a lot of correlative studies, right? Oh, someone with autism has a really different microbiome than someone without. Someone with Parkinson's has a different microbiome than someone without. There, there are a lot of correlations, but I think one thing that really stands out uh, as sort of a caution is correlation is not causation. We might see differences in these microbiomes in these different people with disease, but is it the disease that's causing the difference? or is the difference causing the disease? It's still really not known. We don't know the mechanism by which these things might be acting. So there's a lot of caution, like, to, you know, no yes, it looks like it could be, there could be these connections, but we still don't really know. And, you know, one big step has been to go from just looking at what the microbiome is to testing things in mice. So those mice studies that I just went over, you're at least then like, oh, okay, we're not just looking at the microbiome, we're actually showing that it can change weight, or it can have these different effects on anxiety or your ability to walk across a beam. But again, those are mice. And there have been many, many cases in the past where things that were true in mice are not true in humans. So I think that sort of gets to 
what I would say is an important takeaway, you know, from looking at all these different papers and reading a lot of the literature, I think it's clear that this is a really important area, right? Basically what's happened is because we have new tools, we see that we almost have this whole new organ or this whole new system within us that really plays a role in like our immune system, how we process food, the making of these small molecules is clearly really important and it's all over us and we co-evolved with it. So we're getting these inklings that it's really important for our health and well-being, but we still don't really know the mechanisms by which it's working. So I think what's happening is, you know, I would say, you know, the way to think about it is, yes, you should be very excited. This is something that's important. And I'd say in the next, like, even decade, when you go meet with different healthcare providers, my dentist even recently, like, gave me a handout on how I should be treating my mouth differently because of its pH and what microbes might be living there. I mean, I think it will be something that healthcare providers will be talking to you about as more research comes in and it will impact forms of treatment. But I think right now it's also so this wild west and we also need to have some skepticism. So, you know, there, there's like a billion dollar industry around things like probiotics, which, you know, things like kombucha, the bacteria that are in kombucha are not typically things that live in the human gut. So it doesn't mean if you enjoy drinking kombucha or eating, you know, yogurt, there actually are some studies about yogurt that are beneficial. You don't really know what's going to, be like, live in your gut or not. And all the studies that they've done of probiotics, it seems like it really helps with people who have serious conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, or if they've just had antibiotics, there seem to be some positive impacts. But other than that, there's actually no research suggesting that probiotics, uh, you know, positively impact sort of a standard person's health. And a, a talk that I went to, a sort of leading microbiome researcher said, well, I think of it like aspirin. If you don't have a headache, why would you take aspirin? So if you're, if you're having a condition where maybe there's something off, it can be really helpful. But if you're not, then it may or may not be helpful. And I think the bottom line is we just don't know that much. But because there's still so little research, you know, if you go on Amazon, there are like, you know, hundreds of books about like microbiome diets and what to eat and what not to eat. They're like genomic tests where they say that you can send in samples and they'll tell you what you should or shouldn't eat. There's obviously like a billions dollar industry around probiotics and they're putting them in everything. And the thing is like, you know, I if you like those things and you find them helpful, great, but there's still no like regulation or scientific evidence that for most people these things make a difference. So I think the punchline on the microbiome is stay tuned, uh, be excited, and be skeptical. So thank you. That's it for today. And I'll thank you for coming.